open our hearts and our minds to what God has prepared for us this day. And before I uh, get into the Word and before I pray this morning, I have two special guests with me this day. Um, so, as many of you know, I was uh, ordained at 23 years of age, but there is at least one person in this congregation who knew me before then. Uh, she was a member of my congregation in Bournemouth, England, and um, over the years, uh, she served in that congregation with me as uh, uh, what we would now call a lay minister of worship, um, and uh, has now long surpassed me um, in the ministry. She went to seminary, um, and uh, she is, I have to take my piece of paper because I want to make sure I get the title correct. She is now the most reverend, Angie McLaughlin. She is the Archbishop of the province of Great Britain and Ireland of the Liberal Catholic Church International. Um, she is here visiting and with her wife, Kath. Um, the, would you please welcome with me Bishop Angie and Kath as they rise. When, when we now look at each other and we, we just have to giggle because we know so many stories about each other. Um, but uh, I promised I would not reveal any because she has too many to reveal about me. <laughs> so it is in that spirit that we would welcome God amongst us. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful for your presence this day and for all that you teach us. We're grateful for the sacred text that is read to us both from new words and from words of the Christian gospel. We thank you that you are a God who is still speaking and who is still present this day. So open our hearts and our minds now, O oh God, so that we might hear your voice in that still small voice that lives within us, and that in hearing your voice we might be doers as well as hearers of your word. And now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the living Christ, in whom we pray, amen. So for those of you who are regulars amongst us and for those of you who are new amongst us, we're in the uh, end pieces of a sermon series that we have been preaching since Easter uh, called Reclaiming Miracles. And over the last few weeks, we've been examining some of the miracle stories of Jesus in the Christian Gospels. Uh, we've been reminding ourselves of the importance of those miracles as they allowed those who were the early followers of Jesus to be mindful of who He was in that experience of Christ who lived and walked amongst those early believers. And we've also been reclaiming them because uh, it feels to me that in our world today we have lost the power, we've lost the magic, we've lost the mystery of what it means to be someone who knows Christ personally in our own lives. And so we've been thinking about some of those stories, and it always amazes me. I'm always grateful that people actually listen to sermons these days instead of getting out their phones and checking in on Facebook or something other than that or checking out their newsfeed. I'm grateful that people to listen to sermons. And, you know, a few weeks ago I preached on turning water into wine. And that following week, I got bottles of wine delivered to me. <laughs> Last week, I preached on the fig tree. I had figs delivered to me. I thought this week I would preach on the miracle of the Lamborghini. <laughs> no? Okay. So perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll focus in on this particular text that was read to us from the Christian text that talked about this woman who came to Jesus. Now, sometimes I think that we miss out on the relevance of the sacred text because we live in a very different world than Jesus and those early believers. Uh, we live in a world today of equality. We live in a world today where men and women come together. We live in a world today where there is some sense of equality, well, at least when we come here to Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ. But the truth is that in Jesus' day, there was great separation. Uh, separations between religions, separation between genders and gender identities. There was great separation in the community and for women women specifically who were seen as something less than men, 
Uh, women were often separated out for many different issues that were happening in their lives and in their community, and we give God thanks that we live in a very different world. But the truth is that in order for us to understand the context of where Jesus was and the context of this particular miracle, we need to place ourselves into the social location of Jesus' day. And so here is a woman who has been ill for, it says, 12 years. I can imagine what that must felt like. I'm sure when Reverend Michael was talking to some of those children, they were like, how could we have been ill for 12 years? We're only six. <laughs> but many of us have know what it feels like when we have been ill for a long time. Sense of separation, a sense of loneliness, sense of desperation. And this woman had been ill for 12 years and had been hearing these miraculous stories of a Jesus who was able to heal, a, a Jesus who had taken mud and rubbed mud on the eyes of blind Bartimaeus, and he saw the disabled who were sat by the pool of Siloam, and suddenly the waters were stirred, and Jesus came and enabled him to receive his wholeness and his healing. The woman who had been sat by the well in the heat of the day, and Jesus, who through just that gentleness of the miracle, came to her and offered her wholeness. She'd heard these stories, and here comes Jesus now surrounded by his disciples and a huge crowd, as indeed Jesus was always surrounded. And she takes her moment. She, she comes through the crowd, and she sees Jesus in the distance, and she crawls through the crowd, and she sees just but the hem of his garment, and reaching out with great courage and conviction, and perhaps not wondering what would happen to her, she just touches the hem of his garment, and suddenly, she is aware that she is no longer bent over, that she is no longer paralyzed, that she is no longer in the state where she was is, but she has suddenly realized that in this very moment, in this nanosecond of transformation, she's been made whole. You'd think that was enough. But Jesus, in the midst of, of it all, suddenly realizes that he has been touched, not physically, but just the hem of his garment. So much power was contained in this one that we call Jesus that, that power had been taken from him. And he suddenly says to his disciples, who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you kidding? Are you kidding me? You, you see this whole crowd who is surrounding you, and you expect for us to know who touched you? And Jesus, knowing that something had happened to someone because Jesus was so concerned that lives would be changed, that transformation would happen in the lives of those who encountered him, persisted until this woman, who was not allowed to touch Jesus, who would have been seen as unclean and would have had to have presented herself to the priests in the temple before she would be declared worthy enough to get back into the community, finds the courage in her life and comes before Jesus and says, it was me. And Jesus… <laughs> Jesus, who at that moment was confronted by his religious doctrine, who was confronted by his religious know knowing of who he was as rabbi, who, who could have condemned this woman, suddenly says to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Hallelujah. Your faith has made you whole. Jesus, who, who, who saw this woman come through the crowd, who touched just but the hem of her garment, was now whole and was called to be a witness to the world. At Cathedral of Hope, you might say to us, well, what on earth does this miracle have to do with us? I mean, we, we see the miracles, we, we know the miracles, we, we've read about the miracles all the time. What does this have to do with us this day in reclaiming this miracle? I believe, Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ, it's for a time for us to reclaim the miracle of Jesus' healing in our lives and in this world and in this congregation. There is a spiritual disease in our world right now a spiritual disease, a, a spiritual disease that somehow believes that, that, that one brand of Christianity is more right than another, 
or perhaps more left. <laughs> there is a spiritual disease in our country this day that says that to deny someone of their equality and their civil rights is okay. That there is a spiritual disease in our country that says that men are better than women, that black, white is better than black, that straight is better than gay. There is a spiritual disease in our country this day that has allowed political Christianity to raise its head and masquerade itself as the following of Jesus Christ. And it's time for us to reclaim the miracle of Jesus Christ in our world. The, the, the woman found the courage to be a witness to the miracle of Jesus. It was not about dogma. It was not about political advantages. It was not about whether she was in or out. She just knew that Jesus had touched her. And today in our world, we need the church of Jesus Christ to know that God has touched us, that we have been touched by the miracle of Jesus Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit has fell upon us this day. That is what the church of Jesus Christ is called to be a witness to. And to do anything less is to slap God in the face. And to do anything less is to deny our experience of getting through the crowd and touching the hem of Jesus' garment. How many of us have touched the hem of Jesus' garment? How many of us have felt the power of transformation in our lives? And yet how many of us even though we know that transforming grace, that, that power of Christ that lives within us, live mediocre lives. We might come on Sunday morning and reclaim that power and see it within our lives and see it in the lives of the others, but we are called not just to touch the hem of the garment, but to bear witness to what God has done in our lives. And we bear witness to what God has done in our lives by being change makers in the world by being the hands and the feet. You know, the resurrected Christ is already here. The resurrected Christ is in you and in me. God has no hands but ours, no feet but ours, no mouth but ours, no heart but ours. And the church just seems to be heartless a place deprived of, of the power of God that has come through the hem of Jesus' garment and is already in us, and we've been called to be witnesses. That's what the miracle of Christ is about. It transforms us. It no longer leaves us ordinary. It no longer leaves us bereft. It leaves us filled to overflowing so that it flows out of us and into others around us. That's the power of God. You know, next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating Pentecost here at church. It's one of my favorite holidays. I get to be a flamer. <laughs> As if I'm not 365 days of the year. But Pentecost reminds me that we are called to speak in tongues. And whilst we might not speak in a foreign language without understanding what we're saying, we speak in tongues every time that we greet one another and allow our lives to collide and to see the God in others as we see the God in us. We speak in tongues when we are able to care for one another, love one another, and to follow the commandments of Jesus because our world does not bring those values to bear. We speak in tongues every time that we hold one another in grief, every time we hold one another in our times of despair, and every time we celebrate with one another what God is doing in our lives. And we allow the presence of the holy to be made manifest right in us. And we do that every time we touch the hem of Jesus' garment. It's not in our own power that we are healed. It's in the power of Jesus the Christ. It's in that transforming power of God that makes a way when it seems like there is no way. It is that transforming power of God that calls us to do extraordinary things when our temptation is to turn the cheek and walk 
in the other direction. It's the power of God when we confront racism, when we confront homophobia and heterophobia and transphobia. It's the transforming power of God when we confront injustices in our world in the name of Jesus, when we confront the religious hypocrisy that continues to believe that somebody is better than one other person. Jesus proved that. When this woman come through the, the crowd that day and touched his garment, Jesus proved once and for all that we are all children of a living God, whether we're seen as clean or unclean, that we are made whole in Jesus. And that's the gift we're offered today. And we choose whether we accept it or whether we'll just sit here this morning and enjoy fabulous music and fabulous preaching, <laughs> but go and do nothing, and go and do nothing. Jesus wanted the woman to stand in her courage, and the transforming power of God reminds us to stand in our courage today because Jesus needs a witness. Jesus needs a witness to the transforming power that love offers to us. Jesus needs a witness in you and me to confront whatever is happening in our own world this day and then to live as if the miracle has already happened, to live in that abundance, to live in that grace, to live in that mercy, to live in a way that Christ actually makes a difference in our lives. That's the miracle, because it's countercultural. It's counter to what the world perhaps would expect of us. But we live it, and we claim it, and we reclaim it today. Because a woman, <laughs> how ironic, a woman would crawl through the crowd, see Jesus, not see not see that she was perhaps worthy, but she had the courage to crawl through the crowd and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Who needs to touch the hem of Jesus' garment this morning? Who needs to touch the hem of Jesus' garment this morning? Who needs to touch the hem <laughs> of Jesus' garment this morning? We need revival in this country. We need revival in the church. We need revival to come amongst us this morning and help us to put our trust in God, not trust in powers and principalities that will always fail us, but to put our trust in God who enables us to find our worth just like the woman in our story. Friends, if you are looking for wholeness this day, you're in the right place. If you're looking for the presence of the holy in your life this day, you're in the right place. But whilst you have come to the well, you also are invited to taste and see. Now, if I was a good Baptist right now, I would call the ushers forward. I would turn us all upside down empty us of everything that we have, do an altar call and send you home. But I'm not a good Baptist. I'm a great Baptist. <laughs> so I'm going to invite you later on in our service, because we are on a time frame after all, that as we come to communion this morning, I'm going to ask, invite you to use that as an altar call Oh, I know some of you who come from a Catholic background are saying, now, wait a minute, Reverend Neil. <laughs> but to use this as an altar call, to know that there is some intent and impact that happens when you get up from your seat and you come to this altar this morning, that you are making a decision to reclaim the miracle of you to reclaim the miracle of the courage that lives within you to bear witness to this God that we've come to worship this day. 
and that in reclaiming that miracle, you might go out into the world to witness and to testify to the transforming power that God has provided in your life. I bring testimony my, this morning. I've been changed. There is a Holy Spirit that changes me. And it's not the woo-woo spirit, not the one that we run from. It's the one that I delight in running toward. For that Holy Spirit is the good one that changes us all. Let us run with great race, this race set before us as we run toward the holy this day and allow our lives to be a witness just as the woman was a witness to God's transforming power, may we be witness and evidence it in our lives, in the way we live, and the abundance of God's healing power. To God be the glory. Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ. Amen.